mom and for all their partners and for all their kids. There was always kind of this back. State of Ember, Ghost of You. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, we'll get started in just a couple minutes.
All right, ready to do it? Cool. All right, welcome everybody. Um, January 2019, Ember NYC, we're back with your uh, five star rated Ember NYC meetup. Uh, that's new. I'm, I'm, thank you for all of you who uh, rated us at some point. Um, their meetup is exposing it now, so that's cool. Um, Here's what we have uh, on tap tonight. Um, we're very fortunate to have um, Chad Hytala here with us, um, telling us about um, Ember's uh, templating language, the design of it, where it's going next. Um, and before that, we're going to have a lightning talk um, from Matt Gardner about dynamic component invocation. Um, so very excited about both of those talks. Um, before we get into that, though, I want to uh, make a couple of quick announcements and open the floor to you all for announcements as well. So uh, first up, uh, my name is Luke. If I haven't met you, please introduce yourself um, at some point during the evening. Um, I'm the organizer uh, here, part of the organizing team here. Um, I want to say two, thank, two particular thank yous to sponsors. The first is Movable Link, who obviously you all know is are hosting us tonight um, and feeding us. Um, so thank you to Movable Link. Um, Spencer is our Movable Link representative um, here. And so if you have questions about Movable Link, um, Spencer is Movable Link hiring yes. Ember developers. We're looking for a principal for an engineer. All right. So. so if you've ever dreamed of being a principal, um, is that or vice or a vice principal uh, knocking knocking some heads um, talk to Spencer uh, and um, in addition to that I want to thank um, Ember map uh, the team uh, at Ember map Sam and Ryan for um, d uh, tonight having the entire live streaming um, kit uh, developed built in-house um, so we're live streaming to, to YouTube now. Um, and uh, Sam and Ryan have been great in con continuing to evolve uh, the AV setup here so that we can reliably and easily um, capture these proceedings for posterity as well as for folks who can't be with us in person tonight. So thank you to Ember Map, Sam and Ryan. A um, couple of other things going on. Um, first is EmberConf 2019 is coming up uh, March 18th to the 20th in Portland, Oregon. Um, EmberConf, for those of you who haven't been, is a day of training and two days of conference proceedings. Um, in reality, there's often days outside of that of, of Ember folks hanging out in Portland doing things, um, whether that's uh, co-working or hacking or uh, going on walking tours, ice cream socials, um, beer outings, etc. Um, Portland's a great city, uh, and uh, if you haven't been Emberconf, Ember Emberconf is an exceedingly well-run, uh, well-run conference. Um, so I definitely uh, hope to see many of you out there. Um, here are some of the folks who are going to be speaking. Uh, I believe that um, Sam and Ryan are doing a workshop there. I heard in the podcast two workshops. Um, so that promises to be awesome as well. Um, so anyway, emberconf.com if you want details. A few other things going on. Um, we were talking about this before we got started tonight. Ember.js, the documentary is coming out soon. Um, it's going to be uh, live, premiered, world premiered in Amsterdam sometime soon. I don't know exactly when. Um, and we were talking about the possibility of putting together a watch party here in New York. If that's something that you're interested in being a part of or in hosting, um, let me know. I'm sure we can arrange it and get the word out for, for anybody who wants to come. Uh, I, I'm sure that we there are some probably some fun drinking games to be invented uh, with buzzword bingo sorts of things. Um, but seriously, I, I'm, I consider myself kind of like a uh, a student of Ember's history or an observer of Ember's history, and I'm um, uh, really excited to see how it's captured um, in professional cin cinematography. Um, and then last but not least, uh, I want to mention the Ember Times and some, a few things in the Ember Times issue. Um, anybody who's not on the Ember Times mailing list, you should do that. Uh, Ember Times is an email newsletter. 
um, that is uh, tells us what's going on in the world of Ember, and that it comes out of the learning, the Ember Core learning team. Um, in particular, I wanted to call out uh, one Ember 3.7 is out, um, and two. I thought that uh, Last issue. Uh, one one issue back. Um, there's a video uh, that Gar have called our attention to, which is uh, the state of Ember that uh, Ilya put together. Um, that may be worth a look. Um, and I think that's it for my announcements. We're going to be back um, here at Movable Inc. Um, a month from now, the fourth Thursday of uh, February, which is February 28th, um, with Robert Wagner, who's going to be up from um, Washington, D.C., uh, doing a um, a talk about work using Ember data uh, when your backend is not JSON, a JSON API, um, which is a you know, pretty common situation. Uh, and so um, we're looking forward to his um, his lessons on that. Uh, we, all, we, as always, will have room for a few lightning talks. So if there's something that you're interested in demoing, talk to me. Um, if it's your first time um, giving a talk, I'm very happy to coach you. It's a, um, this is a, an excellent, uh, relatively low stress way to kind of have your first speak, speaking experience if, if that's something that you want to get under your belt. Um, with that, I'll open up the floor to announcements from um, any of you. Um, why don't you come up and you can um, talk into this mic for the folks at home. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Pichot. I work with Matt Gardner at NYC Planning Labs. You'll see him speak in just a bit. And I just want to say that we are uh, about to start hiring again, which is really exciting. Uh, we haven't posted them. It'll probably be a few weeks until we do. But we're hiring a full stack dev. Uh, and as I, think I hope many of you know, we do a lot of work in Ember. And if you don't know what we do at NYC Planning Labs, is we're a digital service unit in the Department of City Planning in New York City. So you'd be working for the city of New York as a public servant. And we build uh, data and visualization tools for urban planners. So if you're interested in the way the city works, if you're interested in data, if you're interested in mapping, uh, we're doing a lot of work and some really significant work in that space. Um, so if, when you see this posting around, if you've got a question, you can come to me. Uh, I'll hopefully post it in the Ember um, discussion groups and, and everywhere else. Uh, and if you have Ember friends who might be interested in this uh, kind of opportunity, that'd be fantastic to share as well. And uh, the last note is we'll be hiring a full stack dev, but we'll also be hiring a data engineer and an interaction designer. Uh, because we're going to take on a, a pretty significant project uh, a, around New York City's environmental review process. So I can get into the details, but it's going to be a lot of data, a lot of really interesting uh, challenges around mapping that information. So uh, come to me if you've got questions. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, and New York City government is a government that is not shut down. Is that right? That's correct. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Um, Garv, come on up. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, Peer IQ is hiring a uh, Ember developer. Well, a person who uh, knows JavaScript and willing to work at Ember with me. Uh, we are looking for someone mid-level, preferably, and will willing to scale up or down depending on uh, who we find. But uh, we're we're definitely we're, we're we're looking preferably for someone who's got at least uh, a, a at least a little bit of experience behind their belt in, in work. Um, other than that, we're wide open, and we're just looking for someone who really wants to work in Ember and is really interested in that. Um, the last thing is uh, Pure IQ is a platform for analyzing uh, bundles of loans. One of the uh, import, uh, one of the causes of the 2008 crash was, well, you had a bundle of loans that nobody knew the details of, and could, and uh, everyone assumed it was AAA rated and totally good, and it turns out they weren't. So if you're interested in, in uh, solving the problem of the markets crashing because uh, no one can figure out what's behind a bundle of loans, that's who we are. All right, take it away. Great. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, Matt, why don't you come up, come up and plug in? Um, and I will just uh, say 
uh, while Matt's doing that, that um, any of those, any of these roles, whether at, at Movable Link, NYC Planning Labs, or working with Garav, um, I can pretty much guarantee that you will learn a ton of great Ember stuff from the folks that are um, in those organizations. Um, so. Uh, our first speaker um, for tonight um, with a lightning talk is um, someone who participated in our component show and tell towards the end of last year. Um, and what, they, what he demoed really blew me away. Um, and so I'm really excited to have uh, Matt Gardner back to talk to us about dynamic component invocation. Take it away, Matt. Hi, all right. Um, so uh, yeah, I, Jonathan and Luke uh, talked a little bit about what um, I do, which is I work with uh, NYC Planning Labs. Um, and yeah, I, without kind of repeating what you've already heard, we build a lot of uh, mapping and data applications for uh, people who live in the city. And so um, that's very broad. Um, but one application I'm going to kind of sh start with is uh, something called simply applicant maps. Um, so if you own property in the city, I, I'm just kidding, I don't own property in the city. But um, if you own property in the city and you want to, for example, open a daycare center, um, then you need to go through the city planning's uh, rezoning process. Um, and what this often involves is a lot of expensive uh, map making, if you're not like a GIS expert, um, you know, you need to work with the city or with the GIS expert consultant to start creating uh, maps according to the, the requirements of the city's rezoning process. Um, and so there are a lot of sort of uh, additional markets that are kind of, you know, that creates this market for consultants who want to, you know, help people with this process. What we decided to do is create an application that makes it really easy for folks who don't have the resources to hire consultants to build maps that make their rezoning applications completely valid. Um, so I'm going to give a little demo of uh, applicant maps. Um, this is a fully Ember app. Uh, I think it uses some, you know, Node uh, backend things. Um, I'm going to get started, um, and let's just say I live in Mulholland Drive. Um, and what's happening here is um, I'm going to be able to, let's see, I wonder if I can search for movable. No, what's the address here? It's like five, five Bryant. Five Bryant. Oh, that's Queens. Okay. Sorry. What did I, what did I do? Oh, sorry. All right. Oh, things are working. All right. Um, all right, so I'm going to say that I want to rezone. I don't, I'm just going to, you know, whatever for the demo, but I want to really rezone this building. Um, and uh, this is my development site, so I'm going to redevelop this building for some reason. Um, it's like SimCity, um, except, yeah, it's as much cheap as SimCity. So, all right, um, I'm going to skip this step just for the presentation, but. The, the meat of this is the rezoning area. So these, these maps you're about to see are the, the sorts of things that uh, what city planning really needs to know and understand um, about kind of what you're proposing um, in your application. So I'm going to hit alter zoning. Um, and what you're going to get here is um, a little bit of kind of what are the existing zoning layers of this building. So um, for example, let's just say I want to turn this into a uh, C5 2.5. Um, any urban planners in the room remember the zoning codes for this? <laughs> no? OK. I'm just kidding. No. Um, well, I actually don't know what that is. But it's commercial something, if you can infer from the C. All right. So, um, so what you're going to do is you're going to draw your shape and kind of fit it to what you know, you're, I'm going to rezone this building as this different kind of commercial zoning, and I'm sure there's some esoteric 
nuance about it, like you can't serve beer or something here. Um, so no more beer, no, I'm kidding. Um, all right, so uh, there are other types of rezoning layers. Um, there's commercial overlays, um, and I'm just going to, you know, for the sake of the demo, kind of just draw something, not a very nice presentation. Um, all right. And finally, special purpose districts. Um, special Matt Gardner district, all right. Um, all right, so what you were kind of seeing was going through a bunch of different maps that were very similar uh, conceptually. Uh, and they used a lot of the same sort of uh, underlying machinery, which is, you know, they need to connect to a map instance, they need to connect to a drawing instance. Um, and so the way I kind of handle that uh, I'm going to show a little bit of code. Um, so, you know, if I kind of, if I just go back to, let's say, underlying zoning, um, and you see the URL here, we have a mode and we have a type. Um, so, looking at the route for this, this route, the file you're seeing here is geometry, is geometry edit. We're, in, uh, we're invoking, we're calling the project geometries component. If we look at that, what this is is a really just a, a really uh, big map with some markup. There's a there's a map component here, um, but the interesting part that I'm trying to show is uh, what you're seeing here, which is this sort of uh, it's it's a component that wraps the sort of dynamic invocation uh, of these different sort of uh, map types that you're seeing in the creation process. So project geometry slash types. So let's look at that. Um, and here we use the component helper. So we say component and then component for type, which is a string. Um, so the information up here in this uh, query parameter, the type uh, underlying zoning, that's actually being directly uh, plugged into the component helper here uh, and pulling in um, the underlying zoning component here. So for as much, you know, if it, it, very early on in the process, actually, as we were learning more about how complex this rezoning application process was, we weren't really sure what types of sort of things there would be. So it was really nice to be able to say, okay, we at least know there's a development site in a project area, but we're learning more and there's actually also a rezoning area, there's commercial overlays, there's special purpose districts, there's underlying zoning. And so what we're able to do is allow our query parameters to kind of directly invoke specific uh, components. We didn't really have to worry about like typing, you know, typing in, um, like uh, changing our markup to invoke a specific component. Um, as we were adding new types, we were able to just think about this through the URL. Um, so that's kind of what the component uh, helper here uh, is letting us do. So here we say component, component for type. Um, and we pass, you know, just some parameters to it. Um, so, for example, if we're invoking commercial overlays, um, and I can actually go ahead and switch over to that. Uh, that component here, this is, so all of our designers can kind of go to this template. They say, okay, I want to change something with commercial overlays. Um, all right, oh, I see a, a commercial overlays template. And then they get the markup for it. There's, I think there's like a little GIF here. Uh, designers can like see the markup and add things. It's a little easier, I think, to kind of think about uh, for if you're kind of, you know, you're not really concerned with like the engineering or whatever of the application. You just want to change, uh, change a few things here. So, um, and then the next step is this mode you see here. So mode equals draw. Um, I kind of glazed, glossed over that a little bit. Uh, there is actually a different selection mode. Um, so what you are seeing was drawing, but there's also something called lot selection, which is a little bit like kind of a niche uh, way of thinking about, I don't know, like if, if you're into uh, city planning data, um, you can select different lots and lots are sort of like the, the tax parcels that, um, that the Department of Finance uh, as a unit kind of, anyway. So if you're a planner and you're like, oh, this is my lot, and you can kind of construct different development sites. But we thought there would be a, a bunch of different modes and there's only two and the draw gets used most. Um, so that's how that kind of turns out. 
Um, right. So, uh, yeah, that's what I've got. Um, this is Mulholland Drive. Um, and um, I'm rezoning Movable Inc. Um, and yeah, is there any questions? Um, I know this is the component helper is not like that new, but I found it to be really helpful for this pro project specifically because I was able to start invoking components through query parameters safely. Um, and yeah. At first, no, but um, I added kind of like an ex explicit sort of check of like what you know, you know what what are acceptable kind of values so far. What happens if there's a wrong value? It breaks. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would, I might like default to um, one of the other sort of types or maybe just a 404. I can't really imagine a situation where you'd go to like, you know, an applicant would be trying to like change the URL, but you know, that's, that's what way URLs way. are for, huh? Yeah, that's the only way they can do it. Yeah. Like, put it in there. Yeah. yeah. It's still Mm hmm Right. It is it is sort of the this like public kind of interface for, you know, getting to a different state in your application. Um, so there are some checks like, you know, that we are using real components. Um, I don't know if this is, you know, the best approach for it, but it sort of was the result of kind of a lot of struggle and so this is where we landed. But definitely I think like in terms of like what is it cross uh, what is it, XSS attacks and things like that. I'm, I'm pretty sure the component helper is, you know, people, I'm sure they've thought about this. I've read some of the <laughs> RFCs on it, so. Um, let's see, yeah, there, there's, there are some behavioral differences, like there are some types require, like mm -hmm. if you see underlying zoning, this type requires this sort of extra call to find what is this concept of the uh, canonical zoning, so what is it zoning right now, versus what am I proposing which is derived from the canonical zoning. So um, I was able to, um, I think, I, I think, Sorry, I'm working on like something else right now, but um, I was able to like have a base class, but then each sort of specific component, I'm able to change things um, as I'm sort of learning the abstraction, like learning kind of like, you know, I don't want to like force myself into kind of, you know, this assumption that I made early on. Um, so I have, you know, different component files for each type. Um, these all inherit from the same sort of abstract uh, base class um, if they have shared functionality. Um, yeah, I mean, the, generally it's the same kind of thing. Um, I don't know if that answers. <laughs> um, so. I've seen this pattern. Yeah. And you don't actually get to leverage some of the conventions that come out of the box router because you know you just don't get those guarantees. Maybe you run into things where you change from one URL to the next, and you don't get the cleanup and startup yeah. that you get yeah. for the route. So it almost feels like the more I see people reinventing this over and over again, which people seem to do with the component helper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's almost separate hierarchy from your actual route, but um, it's just interesting. That you, ran, you ran into the map thing, you know, I've never run into the map thing, but you know, Luke and I talked about it with the mobile case. Mm -hmm. So, have you, have you um, is there a time where it conflicts with the normal router? 
Uh, it doesn't conflict with the router, but some of the teardown things you're talking about definitely apply. Um, because all, all of these uh, specific uh, components need to kind of access the same uh, instance of a sort of a map, uh, map instantiation. So um, there, there's sort of like a transition kind of we need to plug into sort of the teardown logic cross transitions. And then it started feeling, I was like, oh, this is what the router is <laughs> for. Right, right, so right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's another way of looking at it is, you know, what if this were just sort of all at the route level and then maybe there's a, you know, a dynamic, like, you know, dynamic segment. yeah, a dynamic segment that is, that is the type and then it handles some downstream, sorry, downstream stuff. I think what I was trying to avoid was I thought there would be a lot of like crazy, like, just you know, text and sort of willy-nilly images on the on, over here, and I wanted them to have their own sort of like spaces for people. Um, but they, it ended up not being that different. It ended up being sort of this is what we what we got. But the the dynamic segment approach is definitely like probably more conventional. Um, <laughs> maybe I would think about that. But there's uh, times where you have to basically do what you're doing too, where if you had this, if this whole system Mm -hmm. then that wouldn't work, right? Because now it needs to, the, the nice thing about query frames is that they tack onto any URL that already exists. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. Yeah, and there's, yeah, I guess they're like sticky, and so right. if you go to somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's just interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we've, I think we've learned like a lot about kind of what, what the, what the sort of abstraction is in this case. And, um, I kind of missed it, maybe you showed it, but could you show the uh, component for type, uh, like how component for type is produced? The, the, com the component helper? Uh, no, so where that, the component for type, uh, like where that is, uh, that's a CP or? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a computed, um, or type. Um, yeah, so I nest my component, so uh, it's, the type here is, you know, passed down. It's it's sort of threaded, um, which I don't really love. But um, threaded as in passed down a few layers. Yeah. 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 So there's this. There's yeah. Type here. Um, I guess there's like a routing service. Well, no, there's not. There's a routing service. Is not query. I don't think so. I think there's an RFC or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. Any other questions for Matt? All right, thanks so much, Matt. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, Chad, you can get plugged in if you want. So um, our friend Ollie Griffiths is uh, watching the live stream at home. He's not feeling a little under the weather. So first of all, I want to say hi, Ollie. Um, and second of all, I wanted to mention that Ali is uh, once again this year teaching a broccoli workshop at EmberConf. Um, and so uh, he asked, said that we can mention that if we'd like, which I have. Um, so uh, Ali's been thinking about learning about broccoli and uh, experimenting and learning about teaching broccoli for a long time now. Um, and so if, you, if there was going to be one person to learn it from, um, he would be a great choice. Um, so our um, next speaker, I'm excited to uh, have with us tonight. Um, he's a, I, I believe, staff engineer. Is that the title? Uh, senior, staff. senior staff engineer um, at LinkedIn, uh, as well as a member of the Ember Core team. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, if you're a staff engineer, it means you have like a really awesome like wizard staff. I'm pretty sure. Um, so uh, you can ask Chad to show you uh, that pictures of his his wizard staff later. Um, there's uh, strict security protocols for uh, where you can bring your bring your wizard staff. Um, in any event, uh, he's going to tell us about the uh, the design of Ember's templating language. So please help me give it up for Chad Hytella. Okay. So. Yes, I am here to talk about the design of Ember's uh, templating language. Um, I've given a variation of this talk 
uh, in Amsterdam earlier this year, but enough things have changed, so it's good to kind of revisit. Um, as Luke mentioned, uh, I'm a senior staff software engineer at LinkedIn, where I get to work on all different types of open source infrastructure that help power LinkedIn's uh, web properties. Um, I've also been on the core team, it'll be like two years now, I think, um, December conf. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're interested in LinkedIn, just come talk to me after it. But uh, I'm here to talk about templating. Um, so if we're gonna talk about templating, we actually have to go back in the history of Ember uh, and talk about like why we have templating inside of Ember. So for those who aren't aware, there was a framework that predates Ember that was known as Sprout Core that Tom worked on when he worked at Apple. Um, and it's like the, the underlying framework that is used for um, MobileMe or the iCloud stuff. Um, and then together, Tom and Yehuda worked at Strobe um, and Strobe was a consulting company that did uh, like Sprout Core work. And uh, one of their goals was, or I guess one of the things about Sprout Core was that there was no declarative templating language uh, in the actual framework. So what this meant was that uh, you would write these JavaScript widgets, the widgets had themes, and you were trying to abstract away as much as possible like HTML, CSS, and the things that like a lot of web developers are good at. And so the whole idea around Ember, or at the time I think it was like called Sprout Core 2, and then it was Amber, and then so on and so forth. But um, the whole idea was to take this templating language that uh, Yehuda had been working on, which was Handlebars, and meld that together with Sprout Core. And the big selling point here was that you could leverage technologies that web developers knew, like HTML and CSS, um, and also uh, had like this really cool, um, feature, which was like, I write my JavaScript and then the view kind of stays up to date with like this backing JavaScript class. So, but going back to like templating, um, it's really rooted in some pretty key design principles here. Um, and Ember kind of shares the same design principles, or at least uh, it's kind of like founding design principle in the templating layer was shared by uh, HTML. Um, so if you've been around the HTML or the Ember community long enough, uh, you will see this quote be invoked in many uh, types of presentations. And so this is Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and he's talking about the semantic web here and like the design of HTML. And what he says is the computer science in the 1960s to the 1980s spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of effort making languages that were as powerful as possible. Nowadays, we have to appreciate the reasons for picking not the most powerful solution, but the least powerful. The reason for this is that the less powerful the language, the more you can do what, with the data stored in the language. So this design principle, principle is called the principle of least powers. And it's really kind of in, an interesting idea. So what he had in mind here was that you could take HTML, which was, it's kind of like more of like a data format, but it has like a language specification, right? It, it defines the structure. And what you could do with this is you could pass this HTML through different machinery. Could it be like compilers or indexers or whatever? And you could examine the, the content because it's well structured and be able to extract things like tables or do indexing on the content. Um, so it allows you to kind of layer on different types of functionality on, on top of it, which is a really great property. And it's what kind of allows um, Ember to have a templating language and be able to leverage all of these fundamental technologies. So in this example here, everything in the green is talking about the HTML specification. But because the HTML specification doesn't really say anything about the things that go necessarily in between the tags, uh, we can layer on our own API. So in this case, like the double curlies typically means that we're talking about a different thing that isn't the actual HTML specification. It's talking about Ember. So this is kind of the, was one of the founding design principles of the templating language and why we have it in Ember. But more recently, I think kind of the design principles that is kind of guiding a lot of the changes that we're making here um, is this quote by Albison and Sussman. Um, who, for those who don't know, they wrote this pretty famous book uh, called uh, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. It's a book on scheme. Um, but what they say is programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally machines to execute. 
So I think a, it's a very nice quote, and I, we'll see kind of like how that's playing into the design of uh, the templating language as it's evolving. But what it really means is that we're trying to bring clarity to the templating language. Um, and so what do I mean from that, from like a, you know, language design uh, perspective? It means that we're trying to get to much, uh, to more static semantics um, in the different forms that are inside of the language. And so this doesn't mean like removing things like the comp dynamic component helper. It's more or less removing ambiguities inside of the language. So I'm going to go through a bunch of RFCs and kind of give like a backstory on like why they exist. This is a little bit about the R uh, in the RFC. You'll see like a motivation section, but not everybody has all the time to read all these RFCs. And so I can kind of give a backstory a little bit about why we are changing uh, things in the templating language. So the first RFC I'm going to talk about is RFC 276. Uh, this is quite old. We're in like RFC 400 something now. But um, what this RFC proposed was adding an actual argument um, syntax to the language. So looking at, let's say this is a, a template inside of your application. Who can tell me where name is defined and where posts is defined? Is it a thing that was passed to you? Is it a thing that is on the context of the component? The real answer is you don't know. And so begins like this journey of going to look at all of the places inside of the application where this thing is being used. Is it being passed to me? Is it on the component or is it get overridden? You have no idea. So you have to go look at all the different spots. So what this RFC proposes is an at, this at symbol sigil for all of the things that are passed to you directly. So in your template, you can start to distinguish between, OK, this was an argument passed to me. It's not something that's on my class. I don't have to go look at all the invocations. Just know that um, this is kind of like the public interface to the component. Anything with an at symbol is an argument that was passed to you. And obviously, you can conditionally access these and everything like that. But it starts making the template a little bit clearer to understand. And so this landed in 3.4, so it's been around for quite some time. But um, we are now just kind of like updating the documentations, and I'll get to like when those document uh, when the documentation is actually getting updated. But you can you've been able to use this for quite some time now. We're on like 3.7, uh, so you've been able to use it for three minors, so 18 weeks. The next RFC is kind of complementary to the at symbol. So I wrote this RFC. Uh, it's called something else, but for this presentation, we're going to call it required this. So it's the same type of problem. When you're looking at a template and you see something like this, who can tell me what this is? Well, you might think it's a component, but it actually can be many different things. Um, so you don't know. So what this RFC kind of carves out is what does that thing mean? And so as we talked about before, we have the at symbol to say this is an argument that's being passed to you. This dot foo or like the variable name is always talking about the thing that is on the class. Um, and then if you have like a with or a let um, statement, anything that is in the block or yielded out from like block params is a local. And then foo is always a helper without like any type of like sigil or like prefix or anything like that. And so when we go to look at our template, what this would mean is that now we would update the template to be something like this. So this dot name uh, is talking about the context. At post is the thing that was passed to you. And post is a local variable inside of the block. So for those who have worked with like other frameworks like React and I think like Vue have some means of like separating these two concepts out. In React, they have like state and props. Props are the things passed to you. State is always talking about the thing on the backing class. And so the, this is our way of separating those two concepts out. And you've actually been able to do this since 1.0. You can totally, in a template, say this dot whatever, and it resolves to the backing class. There is an asterisk here, because what this RFC is specifically talking about is removing the fallback behavior. Um, and so right now, when we see uh, like the handlebars expression inside of the template, we do like many different checks. We check to see, oh, is it a component? Is it a helper? Uh, if it's not that, is it a local variable? Oh, it's not that. Let's look up on the component class. And if it's not, then it was basically an undefined value. And so the RFC actually 
talks about like a seven phase rollout plan. Um, so don't get like super scared. Um, but so like the first idea was like, okay, let's update the guides. Let's add ESLint rules to, you know, start catching these in newer applications. As you upgrade, you'll be asked to like prefix your things with either at symbol or this dot. Um, we won't remove the actual fallback behavior until 4.0. So we're like still like quite a ways away. Um, but I can say that the three, seven guides, which were released, I think a couple weeks ago now have this in the documentation. So when you go look at any of the examples, you'll see that there is like the this dot prefix on variables and everything like that. So slowly but surely we're rolling out this plan. It's still going to take a lot of time. Um, and I actually even wrote um, a tool that will analyze your templates and give you um, basically do a code mod on top, on top of your application. And the way that it does it is uh, uses runtime information to figure out if like the property fallback actually occurred. That's a whole nother talk. I'm not going to get into it. Um, maybe I'll come back uh, and give like a lightning talk on how that works. So that's all stuff about uh, just generally about the templating layer. Let's talk a little bit about components and how those are changing. Um, so RSC 311 introduced this notion of angle bracket invocation. Um, and what angle bracket invocation is trying to do is once again, trying to answer the question of what foo dash bar is. So we're giving syntactic forms to all of these things. Um, so you may not think like this is like a huge problem, but who can tell me what x dash post is? Here. You might say, oh, it's a component. However, I've ran across this guy in applications before where it's actually just a helper that creates its own DOM element and returns it out. This will work. Um, so you don't actually know what you're talking, uh, what, what the template is doing. And so the idea of having the angle bracket invocation is to once again uh, set, give a syntactic form for an invocable uh, thing, uh, in this case, temp, uh, in, in this case uh, components. So if we update, let's imagine uh, we didn't have that person on our team. This is actually a component. What this would actually update to is something like this. Um, so let's examine this a little bit further. So the angle bracket invocation RFC is really saying, it's really talking about these parts right here. It's saying that these components can now be invoked with like HTML tags, and it must begin with a capital case uh, or the first um, character in the invocation must be capitalized. And this allows us to disambiguate it between like a custom element or anything that may come to the HTML specification in the future. Another nice thing about this RFC is that it removes the need for the dasherization of a component name. So you can now have uh, single word components, which I think is uh, a really nice a cleanup. There's a lot of times where you're like, I just want to call the thing like, um, I don't know, like in this case, like post instead of like X post or something like that. Just so it does a lot of nice things uh, there in terms of cleaning up the API, uh, cleaning up things inside your app that you don't like looking at. Um, the other thing that's different here is like HTML elements, you pass um, the actual path expressions in curlies instead of like the bare word. Uh, like you would, this is like a mustache ex expression and where otherwise you would just pass a normal path expression into things. So it looks more and more like HTML, but you, looking at it in a template, you can distinguish what is a component, what is an HTML element. Uh, the other thing we have to talk about if we're talking about uh, the component layer is splat attributes. Um, and I'll explain what that actually means. Um, so let's say we have our post component here and we're you know, sending posts into it. Um, it would be nice from the outside to be able to pass HTML uh, attributes to this uh, component that you're overriding from the outside. So what that means is you, so the arguments going into the component are prefixed with the at symbol and you refer to them with the at symbol on the inside of the template. Anything that isn't pref other, otherwise prefixed is in talking about HTML. And so what we can do is inside of our template, let's say this was uh, the inside of that uh, template there, we can use dot, dot, dot attributes to splat in any attributes that were passed from the invocation. So it allows you to add additional attributes where necessary. 
And the cool thing about this is that it's not going to clobber, it actually is going to merge. So if you need to add additional like class classes to the underlying template, if you need that, if for some reason like the, the component wasn't um, like accessible and you need to do like a hot fix while you're waiting for the, the PR to be exposed, you can add like ARIA roles to the underlying thing. So it's a really cool way of um, getting HTML attributes into a, a template that otherwise you don't really have access to. And this has been in Ember since 3.4. Um, if you're on older versions of Ember, all the way back to 2.12, Rob wrote uh, a polyfill for it that you can install inside your application. Um, and it, like I said, you can it works from all versions of Ember from 2.12 to 3.3. And then after that, you just don't need it. So that too is, uh, so all those things that I talked about, the angle bracket invocation that, uh, splash attributes, I believe are all in the 3.8 guides, which are the next release. So it's in beta, it hasn't been deployed yet. Um, but those things are coming, so you'll see in the guides all that type of stuff getting updated. Uh, I don't, this is not actually the RFC number. Uh, sorry, I copied and pasted a bunch of slides. But there's a, a RFC called Glimmer Components, which has kind of been uh, long coming. Uh, so f to give a little back, uh, give a little bit of history, mm, four years ago we had an RFC called Angle, it was called Angle Bracket Components. <laughs> Um, and we're like, yes, we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to have this, uh, nice, uh, invoking, um, format or inv invocation style that looks like HTML, but we're actually talking about the Ember component and four years later, I think, or three or four years later, we're finally going to, finally going to get it. Uh, the, what happened was we thought we could build it on top of HTML bars. Uh, turns out the... We actually shipped the version of the angle bracket components in like, I think 113, but they were slower than the one, the like curly style uh, um, components. And so at that point we like uh, removed the, the flag, told people don't use them. We went and wrote the Glimmer VM like several times over. And now we got them, now we got them. Okay, so Let's talk a little bit about Glimmer components. Um, so the biggest thing that's different about Glimmer components is, from the templating point of view is the template that you write for, the, for your component is WYSIWYG. So what you see in the template is what you're gonna get in the DOM. So today, what happens is you would write something like this inside of your template and then you come along and you're like, great, I got this cool ID, I got this Ember view thing, where did that come from? And you're like, gotta go read some documentation and look at some cool Ember APIs like these guys. Attribute bindings, class name bindings, tag name, class name, element ID. And these things are kind of terrible. Uh, they come from, they're very old. I think they're some of them are even holdovers from Sprout Core. So if you don't like those, you probably wouldn't have liked Sprout Core because that's kind of like, how you did things, from my understanding. Um, so these all go away, um, and instead, what you get is you can write this inside of your template, and that's what you're gonna see in DOM. You no longer see like the wrappers or anything like that. And so that's one big thing from the templating language uh, that you get inside of Glimmer components. Now there's other things related to the JavaScript side of this, the class, uh, only has, I think, a did update, a constructor, um, and I think that might be it. There's not like tons of methods. It doesn't have like 27 different mixins version on it. It's a very, very stripped down version of the component model that you kind of see in uh, Glimmer.js. It's not exactly the same thing, but it is very close. And that RFC is merged. I think it merged last Friday. Uh, if you want to get a taste for kind of what this looks like. Uh, Rob wrote this thing called Sparkles Component um, that is using kind of the low-level API that um, allows you to build custom components inside of Ember. You don't actually need the core team to, you know, spec out what a component is. You can actually write your own. There's an RFC and there's docs coming for how to do that type of stuff. Um, but if you want to see what that looks like in practice, you can check out Sparkles Component using your app, look at the, the code. It's pretty cool. 
The other uh, RFC that we kind of have to talk about if we're talking about components is render element modifiers. Um, so last year I wrote a couple RFCs around element modifiers, um, and I'll explain quickly what those are. So in Ember, there is one element modifier, and that is action. So action has a couple different forms. You can use it like um, almost in like the attribute space of an element. So you can say like, I don't know, class equals curly, uh, class equal, or sorry, on click equals action foo or whatever, and you can basically attach that callback directly to the element. There's another one that you use inside of what we call element space. So actually in between the HTML, and it's like a, just a curly curly, it has the same type of signature, but you use it inside of the actual element space. And so um, I wrote a couple RFCs, one about like exposing the, the low level primitives to allow developers to create their own element modifiers uh, inside of their app. And then I wrote like the high level API RFC, but then um, Pazurek, uh, who has been doing a lot of work on the Glimmer components, came up with this RFC, which is render element modifiers. So an example of that would be something like this. So in this case, did insert is going to get called when that div is inserted into the DOM. And then it will call this is inserted uh, action on the, ba on the backing class. And so what this is trying to solve is this problem of DOM access. So in components today, in the did insert element hook, you have this dot, you have this dot element. Um, and you could do all different types of stuff with this. You can like, if you had like a jQuery like calendar or something like that, you need to attach to like this element, or you need to do some type of introspection on the, the top level element, look for like children or whatever inside of uh, the component body. You can do that with this dot element. Unfortunately, we made the templates inside of, uh, we made the, the templates for Glimmer components WYSIWYG, or in just custom components in general, we made them WYSIWYG. So what that actually means is that the templates are now fragments. And you can think of them like a document fragment that it's just like a bag of DOM that's kind of sitting there. So in a case like this, let's say this was in our Glimmer component and you're like, okay, I had like this top level element so I, I would imagine that in my backing class, I would have this dot element. I have like persistent access to this dot element because I have this top level thing. And that's what this dot element is in the curly uh, components world. But what happens when you come along and you do something like this? Because now you can have top level statements inside of your template. What is this dot element in this case? You don't actually know. Um, because you have no idea if like that block, if the if block is going to be open or the else block is going to be open, how are you going to like manage this, you know, this element state when this dot open closes? Like if I attach some event listener somewhere in here, you'd never get notified that those things are happening. So you have no opportunity to like remove listener on things that you might have like, or remove anything that you've done manually to the DOM. And so you can create like memory leaks and all that type of stuff. So what the render uh, modifiers are doing is that you put them on an element, you give it a callback, and then in your on the JavaScript side, you would have something like this. You would get the element as the first argument, the params, and the hash. And so this then gives you, allows your actual component class to have access to many different elements um, that are in your template. And so this is, I, I think, a really cool way of like getting access to the element without having us to like, you know, have this uh, rule of everything has to have a top level element or anything like that. It gives you a lot of freedom, allows you to experiment with a lot of different things. Um, there's other ones besides did insert. I think there's like a did destroy. Um, and I think there's one other one you can check the RFC, but this is probably the one I think most people kind of like run into or use a lot. They use did insert element for things. And so that RFC merged, I think um, last Friday. So that's kind of it for the components. Um, let's talk about this guy. Uh, this is a pre RFC that is somewhere in like Ed's fork of Ember's. Uh, Ed is on, on the core team. Um, he's got like a, a pre RFC for this thing known as template imports. Um, 
So there has been many proposals about an importing syntax for the templating layer to solve this problem that we have in module unification, which is the new file layout. And that is we need to be able to know um, where these, oh, basically where these add-ons that are being invoked inside of your template are coming from. So there's no way today for you to, in module unification, or there's like hacky ways you can do it, there's no ergonomic way for you to gain access to add-on that is in the add-on directory of a module unification add-on in a module unification app. So we need some way of like pulling those namespaces into scope. And so there was like a use RFC that went around or it's still open. Um, hopefully this is go gonna be what we're gonna land on and I'm gonna show what that is. Uh, the TLDR is that we're just going to use a front matter that is using the JavaScript import syntax. And like Sam like kind of started like this whole like rat holing of things in the use RFC. And I think a lot of people were finally, well not finally, but like a lot of people are like, yes, this makes sense. We should just use the JavaScript importing sy syntax instead of like creating another syntax that it acts exactly the same, but it's different because it's Ember. Uh, and instead we're just going to, uh, Try, we're going to use the actual JavaScript syntax. Now this might change, this is a pre-RC, so on and so forth, but that's what the plan is. So yeah, it's kind of scary, right? Um, so how does this actually work? Um, so this dot dot dot, uh, or this dash 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 syntax is really talking about JavaScript. And the way that the mechanics are gonna work out um, I think we're gonna like extract this thing and parse it and everything like that. Um, you cannot write normal JavaScript syntax in here. You couldn't put like a function in there and then like export that into the space. This is merely just for the imports right now, but I'm gonna show a little bit maybe what it might look like in the future. So if we have this in our template, what does the, the JavaScript side look like? Well, it just looks like this. You export select from your template and then down below, anything that's below the, the second uh, triple dash is talking about HTML bars again. And so you're using the, the, the symbol or the bindings that you imported from the top in the lower part of handlebars. And so the, this is our way of kind of binding these two things together. The other cool thing about this is that it opens up the door to be able to do this, which is having values that you can import from JavaScript space and just invoke them. So there's a lot of times where you're like, hey, I got this helper and I only ever use it in this like one component. Wouldn't it be nice if I could write the, 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 the component class and the helper that kind of like goes along with it right by each other um, in the same file? Well, with this thing, uh, it allows you to do this. Um, and so you would import my helper uh, in the actual uh, front matter syntax there and then use it below. Um, like I said, this is a pre-RC, soon TM, uh, until somebody can, I, I think it's actually gonna happen quite soon. Like we've already walked through like what the implementation kind of looks like. Somebody just needs to finish up the RC. Is there still the idea of thinking that there'll be a prefix, like the template could be attached to all templates if you want? Uh, like the, the, the uh, so the question was, is there going to be a preamble uh, that gets stuck to the top of each one of the templates kind of like implicitly? Uh, I don't remember where the, the, the threads have gone on this one. Uh, I would have to talk to either Yehuda or Ed. I'm not sure. Like I was out for like three weeks and a lot of things happened. <laughs> um, so. Before that actually can happen though, we need to do a little bit more rationalization around uh, first class values in Ember. So if, if you think about it, um, all we're doing is importing that, that uh, binding into the template space and then it directly invoking it. Which means that we kind of have to have um, this idea of a value that, you're talking about it as like a helper inside of the scope, but it's kind of like opaque 
but internally and the implementation, we know that like you're talking about helper and modifier and so on and so forth. So what this, what this RFC proposes is to create kind of the, the dynamic forms of helper and modifier as well. So uh, you can do stuff like this, invoke them with strings and everything like that. But kind of more importantly, uh, you can like close over them and you can pass them around uh, like their opaque values. So for example, uh, this is an RFC. Uh, this top example here is like join words helper. And then the bottom is this craziness, but it is functionally equivalent of what the join words thing is doing. So you have, uh, you're creating a, a closure of join words with a separator in the first one. Then you are currying on like foo, then currying on bar. And then at the end, you finally invoke the expression and it unwinds everything like that. So this is like the idea that we can have like these first class values kind of just floating around. And that's how we can just directly import them into uh, the template and be able to invoke them without going through like things like the resolver and all that type of stuff. So this is an RFC. Godfrey, I think, posted this early this week. Um, so do a quick recap. So someday we'll have uh, template imports. Uh, the components will be uh, outer HTML. Uh, there's required this. Arguments have the, the at sigil prefix, uh, angle bracket invocation, and then we'll have uh, these render modifiers. Um, so that is the future. Oh, sorry. So this is kind of the future where we're thinking the, the template language is going to go. Granted, there's a couple things in here that are um, still very much early on in like the design phase, but these are the things that like the core team is really thinking about. I'm really excited about this because I think it. I really like the templating layer. I've worked I worked on the Glee, uh, Glimmer VM for like two and a half years. I like the technology and everything like that, um, and the the language is just getting is way better than what it was when I first started. Like. If anybody remembers the each form that had the implicit scope thing, yeah, don't like that. Um, so that is it for me. I can take questions, and I believe Guarov has uh, a yeah, question. I was asking about that. I wanted to ask about the helper helper. Yeah. Yeah, where did that come from? The helper helper? Yes. Uh, it, it's new, so that's an RFC. Oh, okay. So you can comment on it if, 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 you, if you'd like. Yeah. Helper helper helper? Yeah, helper helper. <laughs> How many levels can you go? Yeah, you can go all the way down to turtles, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just Anyone has questions? Uh, yeah. Um, with Sparkle's components, um, I've not played around with them, but you mentioned that we only get did render or did update or something like that hook. Mm -hmm. I often use did receive adders mm -hmm. uh, and not observers. Mm -hmm. um, what do we do in those situations? Uh, so did receive adders. I'm trying to remember what like the corollary to those. Things. So it's always, did update always is called when the arguments to you change. So that's like did receive uh, adders. Now, to simplify a lot of things, we no longer, I don't think we give you like, uh, we give you the new ar uh, arguments inside of that hook, but you're kind of like responsible for like updating the state of the world uh, at that point. So you no longer, I think you used to get like did receive adders and you get like the before and after. I don't remember if that was that one or if it was like init adders. There was something that was like that. Um, so yeah. You're, it, it should still have, I think, the same timing semantics that did receive adders has. Um, it's just like res you're responsible now for like doing the updates if there's any interior mutations that you have to do. Um, you also have track uh, track properties, which I didn't talk about at all uh, in the, and that allows you to do the state manager, or it's kind of like a nicer version of computed, I guess, is a way of saying it maybe. Cool. This is awesome. Thanks, Chad. Yep. So um, two questions. The first is I know that you know, the Ember, uh, Ember's templating language came from handlebars mm -hmm. originally. We've essentially at this point just forked. Like we don't mm -hmm. feed anything upstream yeah. or anything like that at this point, yeah. which is its own thing. Yeah. Um, and is there uh, any value or discussion about like having a, like making this a standard or... Mm -hmm. So, so like that. I think there is a couple things. Uh, 
because some of the things that I showed, like the importing syntax is such a departure from where handlebars is today, um, we're thinking about like, so I, I didn't put in the slides, but like long term you could uh, think of like that front matter is talking about JavaScript, the bottom is talking about kind of like HTML. Um, maybe you had like a place to put CSS. So I think kind of long term we're thinking about like the single file component uh, type of file layout. Um, and also with this uh, importing syntax to also kind of bucket in along with other things that are hard to, uh, let, me, let me rephrase. Um, so yes, it's different. We want to differentiate it like for real at some point. I don't know when that is and that will probably come with like a specification for the actual file layout. Um, it also may change some of the rules with the templating itself. So for example, we have like the property fallback uh, behavior. If we said that we're gonna do like the import syntax, we might also say like, if you're using this import syntax, it's also gonna change these other things. And it may be like, there's no longer any fallback behavior if you're using this style of a component. Another one that comes to mind is, um, Ember has this really interesting story around like, uh, HTML attributes and like props that get slotted onto the actual DOM element. And there's like a, there's a whole test suite around when do you slot the property? When do you call set attribute? And we would probably at that time uh, move to everything to being setting attribute with opting into setting the prop. And so this, make thing, this makes things like, uh, I think there's like, um, something, there's a project called like custom element uh, compatibility that a lot of the other frameworks are trying to you know, make custom elements work inside of the framework kind of like seamlessly. And we need to be able to kind of break these two ideas apart because right now they're kind of mix match for um, compatibility sake. Mm -hmm. And at that point we would probably, you know, ha actually define the, when do we set attributes? When do we actually set props? Uh, so to be like opting into strict mode or yeah, something. Yeah, it's like the way that we were talking about is like this is strict mode. The other root mode is sloppy mode. So mm -hmm. welcome to ES5 <laughs> HTML bars edition. Uh, <laughs> um, this speaking of sloppy mode, uh, the other thing that I when I'm working in working with Ember's um, template language that I find myself surprised at sometimes is uh, when I need a helper, um, it feels like there's a, a lot of, feels like a little bit too high of a hurdle to like go make a helper. Yeah, yeah. Um, and where, where, particularly because I feel like the thing I need is like, it's a JavaScript function. Yeah. Can I just drop the JavaScript function in the yeah. component and be done with yeah. it? Um, I'm curious about the, like what the thinking around that is. Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember if it's Godfrey's RFC or it was another RFC that proposes something like this to be on like the class or maybe it was like modifiers of defining it on the class and then kind of, it would be like a decorator or something like that saying that this is a helper um, and treated as such inside of the templating layer. I don't remember which one it is, but yeah, I think this is like one of the things that uh, I would really like is to make helpers and creating them much lower barriers to entry because it, right now it's very weird. They're global. You can create one and now leaks unless like you've done the nested file structure thing. Um, yeah, I, I want this because I, I don't want to uh, tell people like, oh, you should not use component classes. But I, I really think like the templating language is getting very, very power, powerful and you can do a lot of things just in the templating language with helpers and with modifiers. Um, and I want to see what that world looks like and being able to have like an import syntax where I can just define those things, JavaScript thing, and then just import them all and I can put like a ton of them in there. I think it would be awesome. Um, this is awesome. Um, I had a question kind of, it's not directly in the presentation, but, but it kind of concerns importing. And there, there have been times when I've wanted to 
for example, like when a add-on component or something yields something, mm -hmm. maybe I want to extend that add-on component, but maybe I don't want to just copy and paste the sort of template. Is mm -hmm. there, what, how does this sort of like this problem, of like I'm not necessarily extending templates, but there's sort of this sort of like public API of like what the add-on component yields mm -hmm. out. Yep. And it'd be cool to like, I don't know, extend that, or maybe I'm just, I haven't found a way to do that and you can already do it, or is so, there thinking around that? I don't know. Yeah. I think what you actually want is name blocks, which I had in this presentation. Yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, the import thing has been the rabbit that we are now chasing. Uh, so there's an RFC that's quite old. It's merged. We're, we're going to do some form of it. There's some issues with it as we've kind of like iterated on the template language more. Um, what name blocks allows you to do is define sections of the template that are gonna get glued into the backside of the component. So it gives you extension points when you're like calling, let's say, foobar, and foobar allows you to define, let's say it has like header, foot, or body. It allows you from the caller's point of view to insert your own HTML that gets used when in the backing components template. So it allows you to do like this compositional patterns uh, that you can stitch different templates into different places that you otherwise would not be able to do. Um, the only other way that you can do this is um, you could create a bunch of components that uh, you cr like basically use the closed over form of them, pass them as arguments directly into the component, and then it uses them. But you're effectively defining the slots uh, when you're calling it. I, I can show an example of kind of what that looks like. I had it in my slides, but uh, yeah, I don't. My blog post where it was something about like I think involving like sorry the the component helpers, and I think it, yeah there was like I've been trying to do this forever, but then I yeah. found like a one way of doing it without an add-on to yeah. Like, right. I have some questions. Okay. How long are you here? <laughs> how long am I here? Yeah. Afterwards? <laughs> no, just right now. Like, how long can I, do I have you here? Like an oh. hour, two hours? <laughs> I guess uh, it ends at 9. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, but I got to leave at 8.45. <laughs> um, is there a timeline for template imports? No. Okay. There's a timeline for the other stuff. Like, uh, yeah. A lot of the other stuff has been merged, but in terms of when it becomes kind of first class, like <laughs> makes end of the guides and stuff, there's priorities and timelines there. But with template imports, there's not. Uh, so... There kind of is, because we want to ship the new file layout. To have the new file layout, you have, we have to resolve this problem being able to import from add-ons. So I don't know what the timeline is, but it has to be solved for us to release like new file layout module unification. So that was my next question, was how do the template imports affect module unification? Or they, whatever are, it's they are related. OK. Yeah. No more. You can tell us about I, that. I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I'm not working on module unification. I, been, I haven't been in the conversations too much with import uh, stuff. Uh, the, this is like Yehuda, YCATS. Uh, it is in their brain. I've right. talked to them a little bit about how the implementation might go, uh, but um, all I know is like what's in like the, the Discord channels and pointing to RFCs and reading the conversation there. Yep. Right. Um, we wanted to start using angle brackets, but we use a lot of nested components. Yeah. So that, and other people we've talked to, that seems like, you know, it's great that curly still work, but you kind of want some rule for, you don't want half your components to be angle brackets and half them to be curly. So yeah. I think, you know, me personally, and I think a lot of people are going to wait to pull the trigger on angle brackets until you can just use that everywhere. Yeah. And it seems like that depends on. Yeah, I think uh, with that, Yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I refuse, yeah, I think I that's a, that. a valid point, and that's kind of why all of these concepts are rolled up underneath like the octane <clears throat> track. To like, there's these things are painful, and they bring a lot of. Um, they're related. Uh, what's that? They're like intermingled with each yeah, other. All, yeah, they're all. They're all. They're all. Certain things work. If you want to have everything nice and pristine, everything like that don't recommend like adopting a lot of this stuff uh, for everything. You can do it for some things, but if you don't like that in your project where things are in an in-between state, I would wait till the Octane edition is, is done. Um, and for those who aren't 
aren't familiar what uh, additions are. They're like, just like, it's an RFC, you can read it. It's not merged yet, but we're in the middle of one anyway, because. Uh, <laughs> so what an addition is, is it's just a period of time where we're trying to land a bunch of new type of APIs in a backwards compatible way. It's like an add only way, but they're all kind of like interrelated. But if you try to just use like one or two of them on their own, it doesn't feel that great. And we need all the pieces to be kind of done before everything is like kind of what we uh, envision, like the new programming model to be and all that type of stuff. So you have um, this period of time where everything's kind of like in a little bit mixed state, but then when the edition ends, it's like RQ to like update all the guides, tell people like this is like what it, what it means to write like a canonical Ember application. Um, because we don't really want to, we, we can land all this stuff in a backwards compatible way because they're like just new features. Um, and so, but we do need a time when the mental model of the framework has changed and how we want, how we think developers should think about building applications, that idea has changed. And there's no good way of like, like that's thought, like we're not gonna put like Semver on thought even though like that's kind of what additions are. They're like saying this is like, okay, this is the old world, this is like the new world um, and transitioning everybody to those things. Now, what does this actually mean in practice? So this means that the guides are gonna have to support the previous edition and the current edition during this kind of mi migration period. And so you, you can see like, if you see some code example, you're like, I have nothing like this inside of my app. What is going on? You can like click back and be like, oh, are you looking for something that looks more like this? Oh, okay, yeah, this is just kind of legacy. Uh, it still works back it, and it still works today and everything like that, but this is kind of where things are headed. Um, so that's how we're gonna like onboard people is like kind of have two versions of things for some period of time. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Um, the this.foo versus at foo, yeah. is that related to what you're talking about where right now when you pass through uh, arguments, they become properties and so yeah. it's nice that we have this.foo versus at foo as syntactic ways to differentiate. So yep. you can look at that template and know unambiguously what that's referring to. But at the end of the day, if I render a component and pass in foo, I could render it either way. Like it's, cause right now mm. the argument is oh, yeah, automatically set as a property. Yes. Yes. And so um, it's nice that the at symbol unambiguously refers to the argument that was passed in and a component could like mutate the foo property. Mm -hmm. But um, is there a world where we don't automatically set that in yeah. a way that React doesn't automatically right, put every right. prop as So state? yeah, I didn't touch on this, but uh, like Glimmer components, Sparkle's component doesn't do this. It doesn't merge them onto the actual component instance. Uh, they are given to the component instance as this.args. So even there, they're kind of separated out and they're like, uh, I think that it's like a frozen bag so you can't like mutate it or anything like that. So does that mean there's no way to access that in an Ember component? There's no equivalent of this.args? Uh, I mean, it technically exists, but you probably should not use it. Okay, <laughs> okay, that's a fair yeah. answer. Um, yeah, I guess the last question was just what you just answered, which is like, we have two ways of invoking components now. We have, um, you know, there's some still multiple ways of doing actions. Mm -hmm. um, I guess additions, like that feels kind of, I guess I was gonna ask kind of what your thoughts are on that and yep. then what's the answer. I guess it's kind of the addition yeah. stuff that you talked yeah. about. I think it, it gives us the opportunity to like migrate the community in terms of like how they're thinking about building their applications. And then just eventually over some period of time, just the old ideas, like the code just doesn't need to really exist because like the community has moved on uh, to the new mental model, the new way of building your applications by default. Um, I think that is like, Ember is kind of interesting because it's been around for quite some time and continues to evolve. And I think I really like this strategy because um, me personally, there has been times where I'm like, we need some way of just like calling all of this crap. Like th there's better ways of thinking about how to do this, simpler ways that I think will make writing applications that we have 
or people's app making new features and everything like that and people's apps that exist today nicer to work on, much easier to understand, but also it is a very good opportunity for the Ember community to like gain even more users of it and everything like that, especially with uh, I think some of like these newer APIs like the Glimmer Components stuff, the decorators stuff, which I am hoping is gonna go to stage three. I think that's this week or tomorrow or something. I don't know, maybe. I don't know what day it's on. It's TC39, it's like the standardization body. We need decorators to go to stage three. I think it's this week or next week um, where they're gonna decide on that. So, yep, that's it. That's it for me. Thanks, okay. by the way, for all your work over the last few years. It's been yeah. awesome watching it. Yeah, so. thanks. Anyone have any other questions? <laughs> cool. All right. Encourage everybody to come across the street for, for a drink. If you're on the live stream, uh, it might be some distance for you, but uh, you're still welcome. Croton Reservoir, uh, right across the way. Um, if you, whether if you're going over there or if you're not, um, I would encourage you before you leave here to introduce yourself to some one person that you don't know that you haven't met yet, um, just to uh, help grow the community. We'll see you back here February 28th. Um, thanks everybody for coming out.